I am here to facilitate this session. Um, I'm delighted to see so many of you, many of you whom I know, um, some of you who I do not. So welcome on behalf of the program. Um, I hope you get something great out of it tonight. I'm sure that you will. Um, just a couple of little sort of uh, instructions so you know how this is gonna go. Um, I am, as I said, everyone is, is gonna re remain muted. Um, that's to minimize background noise. Um, we have a chat function at the bottom of your screen, which we will be using, um, Sherry will be using during her session, and it's a way for you to communicate directly to me if you need something, if you have a question about something. You can also communicate to Joe Bashadi, who just uh, turned off his video, but he is our program assistant. He's here <laughs> as well to facilitate. Um, we are going to be recording the session, um, just so that you know that up front. Um, at a certain point in Sherry's session, she may um, ask for volunteers to read. She might ask for people to answer questions. Um, I think what we'll do is you'll type into the chat bar what, if you'd like to answer or participate, and then I will either unmute you so you can speak or I will read for you. We'll see how that goes, okay? Um, let's see, anything else I wanna tell you by way of that? I don't think so. Um, you are welcome to keep your video off if you are feeling shy. Also welcome to, to turn it on so we can see you and smile. Um, I am going to uh, be quiet for most of the session and uh, now I'm going to introduce Sherry Flick who is going to be leading us in objection, looking closely at how objects are used in fiction. And Sherry, many of you know her, she is a long time, much longer than I, at Chatham, friend of Chatham's <laughs> MFA program. We are very lucky to have her on our faculty. Um, her official bio reads this way. Sherry Flick is the author of the novel Reconsidering Happiness and two short story collections, Whiskey, Etc., and Thank Your Lucky Stars. Her stories have, have been published in many anthologies and journals, including Flash Fiction Forward, New Sudden Fiction, and New Micro, as well as Plowshares, New World Writing, and Wiggly. She served as series editor for the Best Small Fictions in 2018 and is co-editor for Flash Fiction America, forthcoming from Norton, Big Norton, in 2022. So I'm delighted to welcome Sherry Flick. Thank you, Sheila. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, it's always weird because, you know, you're actually really talking in your kitchen to yourself. So the world out there is imaginary, kind of, which is, which is connected to fiction, of course. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about objects um, and how they can be used in fiction and also in um, longer projects. Um, and I thought it might be fun to start off um, getting you in the, the mindset of thinking about objects by um, thinking about if you were an object right now, what would you be like today, you know? So I was writing this yesterday and at that time um, I thought um, I am um, this um, dimpled and mangled sponge. That's me. That was me yesterday. I'm better today. I don't say I'm like put together. But yesterday I was the sponge. And I, I was, uh, this is from our kitchen sink. And I was looking at it. I was like, oh, yes, that's perfect. It's a perfect object to reflect like my mood. And if I was a character, it could help reflect me. So if you were an object, what would you be? And if you could type your object into the chat, um, that would be great. We'll have a nice list of objects and um, I'll end up, <laughs> end up reading them out. So far we've got a stapler, um, a very expensive fountain pen. Someone's having a good day. Teacup, a spoon, a pillow with a pillowcase half pulled off. Yeah, a feather, a large ceramic bowl, an old sofa, a watermelon. These are great. So you start thinking how objects, you know, we, we um, we look over them sometimes, right? I mean, in our, in our work, we, we, we put some things into a scene, but we're really focused on plot and characterization and dialogue and all the other things that are maybe more difficult. And um, I sometimes think um, when students first take my classes, they feel that I'm um, mundane. Like I, I really go for these small micro elements because I believe in them so strongly as building blocks of stories and novels. Um, so, you know, I like sentences. I like sentence revision. I like to talk about point of view. I like to talk about punctuating dialogue. All of these things I feel are really important because I feel like 
as a writer, I'm, I'm of the like carpenter brand of writer, right? I'm like, I want some tools so that I can make a table and I want the table to be great. I don't have lofty ambitions in the, in the sense of, um, there's not a lot of high theory, but I feel like, you know, mastering these small tasks, tasks help you to do and uh, to create, to, to write um, fantastical and experimental and really um, solid fiction. So this is why I want to talk about objects. Um, and I think sometimes um, when we put something into a piece of writing, like my example was, because uh, I have this in my kitchen behind me, there's a, I have a vase with some yarrow from my yard in it. And let's say I put that into a scene. Um, I feel like we often um, think, okay, well that's there and I can't change it, right? But if we can look back into our drafts and think about in revision, what if that was a crystal vase with roses? What if that was um, a, a tin can with paper cut out flowers in it? How would that then change the scene, change the characters, change the tension and interaction? Um, I think we need to be actively thinking about this in, 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 in revision. Um, but before I get specifically into objects, I want to talk a little bit about observation. And if you've had me for class, um, I tend to talk about observation a lot. And I have my students do some observation exercises um, the first or second day, usually. Um, I feel like it's important that we practice this as writers, because it's our job to record the world. And if we don't practice our observation skills, then um, maybe we aren't getting the detail that we need in, into our work. So I've been um, doing observation exercises now for 10 years, um, which is a crazy long time. And I feel like um, sometimes my observation is almost hallucinatory because like everything like kind of shimmers with meaning because I'm kind of looking very closely at things all the time. But in looking closely and practicing observing, so, you know, thinking about um, not just glancing over a, 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 side, a, a corner of your room, but thinking about the juxtaposition of the objects. Um, the more we do that, the more we can create flawed scenes, which is what the world's about. So, for instance, right now I can see there's a jar of lotion, an abandoned um, phone cord be, um, beside a coaster that my student Leah made for me and a houseplant. Right, so I start seeing all these things, some scraps of paper, all of this isn't tidy. And I, I start thinking about, well, as these objects are beside each other, how does meaning rise from them? So um, the idea behind that is observing without judgment. And it's a theory from Chekhov, which um, I, I, I kind of align myself in the Chekhov world of Russian authors, many different lines, but I'm a Chekhov person. Um, and he believed um, the writer's job was to observe and not conclude. The writer's job was to put onto paper what you see and not to solve the problem of what you see. That was part of what happened as your reader re read through. And essentially, I think this is um, the um, origin of the idea of show, not tell. So the more you observe objects, the more you start to understand the world. Um, let me see, I'm just looking over my notes. Okay, so Chekhov. I want to read a quote by him. So I'm going to attempt to put this up on the screen. I think I can do it. Share screen. Desktop. Okay, can you see that? Someone, Sheila, can you see that? Can you see it? No. Share screen. Desktop. Can you see it now? Ah, we practiced this. Sherry, are there any other options other than desktop? 
Let me see. Screen. Share screen. Whiteboard. Oh, wait, here, let's do this. I think this is going to work, people. Can you see it now? No. Ah, OK. Well, mainly I had the PowerPoint so you could read along with me. So let me do this, and then I'll try again. I don't know. Hmm, that's weird. OK. So Sorry, do you want to send do you want to send it to Joe and Joe can try to share screen? Okay. Oh, you guys list more list more objects while I'm down this. Okay, I sent it off to Joe. So, um, eggplant, eggplant, we have two eggplants, chip flower pot, ace bandage, coffee mug. Good job, cheese grater, love it. Um, okay, so let me just um, continue. Um, so here's what Chekhov said. One has to write what one sees what one feels truthfully, sincerely. I am often asked what it was that I was wanting to say in this or that story. To these questions, I never have an answer. There is nothing I want to say. My concern is to write, not teach, exclamation point. And I can write, and, and I can write about anything you like. Tell me to write about this bottle and I will give you a story entitled The Bottle. Living truthful images generate thought, but thought cannot create an image. So that last line I think is important. Living truthful images generate thought, but thought cannot create an image, right? You get into that essential show not tell idea again. So we have this idea of the bottle, an object. Here we go. It's built right into the Chekhov quote. Um, and after teaching this quote for, you know, a quite, about, um, a quite a bit of time, I, I have read this quote to students and given it to them, um, I decided I would write a story called The Bottle, right? Like, take the challenge of Chekhov and just, like, bring it. Okay, I'll, 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 write, a I'll write a story with this title, too. Um, so what I want to do, um, tonight I'll read to you a few different things, only one thing from me. Um, I'm gonna, I want to read the story, The Bottle, and talk a little bit about its origin and how um, the object is used in it. And for those of you who may not know my work, it gives you an introduction to kind of the kind of work I, I tend to write. Um, you share and, it? Yeah. Sorry, do you want me to start sharing it? The PowerPoint? Uh, no, wait okay. um, until I'll, I'll bring it in for the next thing. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Okay, um, the bottle. Francine cracked the bottle on the table edge. She smashed it twice. It was a thick wine bottle and it blossomed open with ragged edges. Afterward, she set the bottle upright on the tabletop, its fractured top like a crown. The table's slippery wooden surface smelled of lemon oil and perfectly reflected the bottle in reverse. The candles sputtered and little pins of light bounced back off the green glass. Francine's eyebrows tilted toward the bridge of her nose, sloped in to say she was thinking hard. Seth watched her eyes, the thoughts ticking through. He considered the possibilities from here on in. Everything changes when someone smashes a wine bottle without preamble or warning. Have a bad day, Francie, Seth finally asked leaning back in his chair. The chair's two back legs ground some loose glass into the wooden floorboards. The accountant's at your back again. He twisted his napkin from his lap, laid it out on the table like a broken bird. They'd been having a fine dinner. Seth had come home early to get things going. He'd rinse the Brussels sprouts fresh and in season, then let them soak in salted water until they sparkled green. He chopped up garlic and sauteed it until it was crispy. He cooked some ham and pasta, 
pulled a bottle of red from the rack and splashed the wine into big goblet glasses. Now the empty bottle balanced on the table like a dare. Francine eyed the fractured bottle. She felt better, for sure, but now she'd have to explain herself. She hated words. They did her in every time. What she wanted was action. Action without repercussion or discussion. Pure, clean decision-making. But she knew this wasn't how the world worked, or it wasn't how Seth's world worked. Things were talked through and hashed and rehashed and reasoned. She wanted some unreasonableness every now and then. Was that asking too much? Francine finished the last little splash of wine in her glass. She carefully carried her plate to the sink, held it above the slick gray metal, and then let it drop with a crack. God, that felt good. But now she'd have to explain that, too. Seth eyed her up. This was new territory in their 10-year marriage. Everything was changing all around Francine. She couldn't seem to stop it. She liked repression and denial and passive aggression. It seemed so much easier. She liked quick meals with frozen vegetables. She wanted to swim upstream away from all these foodies and do-gooders. Francie, why don't you just head out of the kitchen before you break something I really care about, Seth said. He held tightly to his wine glass, a favorite from a set he'd carted back from Italy years before. Seth loved things. He looked hurt and worn out. He just wasn't up for her, was he? He thought he could do it, could take her on, but Francine could see the fabric of their relationship wearing thin. She stomped out of the kitchen. The loose floorboards made the table shake clanging the glasses and cutlery and serving dish together in a food symphony. She strode into the living room and out the front door. The bottle had snapped so easily, like a chicken's neck. Not clean, but easy. She'd have to explain, but not now. She inhaled the clean, sharp country air. Fall at hand and the world seemed reset, beautiful and crisp and new. The moon wavered back at her through the creepy tree limbs as if it understood and needed no explanation. The world just didn't fit right, Francine thought she might say to Seth. Tell him how the world wasn't fitting right. Try to show him what didn't work. Like their beautiful house she didn't deserve, and him. She probably didn't deserve him either. The world was so big and the hours so long. How could she have predicted this ending? She exhaled, crossed her arms. The bottle broke so neatly. It cracked and drew Seth's eyes up to hers from his meal. He saw her clearly then, she was sure, his fork suspended above his dwindling plate of pasta. What she won't tell him is that he looked at her then like the first time he laid eyes on her. And that made it worth it. It made her want to do it again. So that's my story, The Bottle. Um, it's about 750 words for those of you who care about such things. Um, solidly in the flash fiction world. Um, and so I had the idea of writing a story called The Bottle. Um, and then there was an evening, we were at someone's house for dinner and I saw the, they had a really high shine on their table and I saw the wine bottle sitting there reflected, you know, in this beautiful, like, you know, opposite down into the table and that image just really stuck with me and um so i knew that was going to be like the beginning and the source of this story um and then i knew uh really early on that the um, person was going to um, try and uh, smash the bottle and I thought oh maybe it should be a beer bottle and I thought oh maybe they should be having a fight and all these things that seemed like too easy um and so thinking about the bottle and then having it be um Seth it, it isn't a moment of anger <laughs> you know the, the wine bottle is smashed and Seth doesn't know what is going on right that for me ended up being like a great way to propel the story forward and it the bottle the smashing of the bottle made me think, who is Francine? You know, she isn't me. I love food. You know, I'm the do-gooder. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of her. So it helped me to find Francine in the story, um, which ended up being uh, just kind of a great gift, you know. Um, let's see. 
Oh, and then the other thing to think about with objects is there's a kind of fallout from them, right? So I have the wine bottle, it smashes, she sets it on the table. Um, and I ha so then I have other objects I can, I can play with. I know there's gonna be wine glasses on the table. So those end up being imported from Italy and very precious to Seth. But then there's the shards on the floor. So I could use that where he like rocks back in his chair and he grinds the shards in. And that's just like a great, um, you know, evocative detail. So if you have an object in a piece, think about, you know, what goes with it and how it can help with the mood, the characterization, all of that kind of stuff. Um, another thing too that helped me, um, the bottle helped me with was, you know, creating this alternative logic of Francine. Like she, li she likes passive aggression. She, you know, she likes all of these things. And I was thinking, well, that's the kind of person who would do this and would also smash their plate in the sink. You know, that, that, um, that logic seems sound for the kind of alternative situation that I'm setting it up. Um, and one last thing about this, and then I'm going to see if you have any questions actually about this story. Um, it's important to note that the character Francine herself is mulling over the bottle, right? As author, I'm not mulling over the bottle in, uh, in, in the text. So Francine herself returns to the bottle because she's a bit shocked at what she did, quite frankly. Um, and I have her, every other paragraph begins with something like, Francine eyed the fractured bottle. Um, the bottle had snapped so easily. The bottle broke so neatly, right? So we're in Francine's internal thoughts during that. Um, and so I think it's good to have your characters thinking about the objects, but as author and as narrator, um, you don't want to showcase them too much because then they aren't in scene, they aren't incorporated into the world. It's a small detail, but um, it's a kind of nuanced thing that I think is really important when you're thinking about how to like work these objects to your, to your favor in your writing. Does anybody have any questions about this story or some of the ideas I brought up in connection to the bottle? You can type them. You can either type them or you can just you type can, that you have a question and I can jump up and down you and can ask. Move your hands. <laughs> um, in Jungian psychology, the bottle represents transformation. Thanks, Stacy. Okay. No questions? There's a question. Oh, there's a question. A couple questions. Do you see them, Sherry? In the chat? Do you ever? I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll read it out loud. Do you, this is from Dan. Do you ever pair an object with other objects that don't usually accompany it? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. It's a way to create tension, I think, right? I, I think um, pairs of three um, I, you know, are important in general to create tension um, in theater and in, and, in, and in writing. But I think you can often you know, put one um, kind of off object in and it, and it makes uh, a normal scene kind of glow a little bit and it makes your reader take note. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And then Garth wants to know what the name of the, which book is, is this story? Oh, this is from Thank Your Lucky Stars, which is out with Autumn House Press. Um, and it's available through Bookshop or if you're in town, White Whale or any of the bookstores really, if you'd like to. Um, Holly asks, or Holly says uh, that she writes nonfiction, but likes to use ob ob objects in her nonfiction uh, as well. Do you find it just, this just as effective uh, for nonfiction writers? Yeah, except you have that weird, tricky truth aspect to, to, <laughs> to nonfiction, you know, which I also, I also write nonfiction, but um, so I think it's really important for me in writing nonfiction, especially if I'm doing interviews, um, when I try to get to the interview early so I can actually take notes about the room and find some objects that um, I can highlight in the piece I'm writing. So I think in nonfiction, you maybe have to think ahead a little bit more than you do with fiction. But again, I think if you can, um, if you can put like an object that maybe doesn't fit in, into a, a, the room with an interview, it ends up like kind of helping characterize the person, the person that you're interviewing and it helps make um, the nonfiction richer as well. 
Okay. Okay. Um, so, Joe, can you put up the the slide? What can object? What can an object do for you? It's the third one. Okay. Four. Yeah, I can. Can you all see it? Yeah. Okay. Good. Awesome. Um, so. I hate PowerPoints, just want to say that, but um, I, thought, I thought that some of this stuff I should, you know, put up here so you can read along and also so that if you kind of, it'll help you if you want to take some notes, it'll be, it'll be right up there for you to see. So here's just a quick list of the things that objects can do for you and um, some of this you can see in the story that I just read and some of it will really materialize in the stories um, that I'm, a, I'm about to read for you. Um, so it can immediately create setting. Um, again, as I said before, you pick a wine bottle over a beer bottle, you pick a wine bottle over a whiskey bottle. These are decisions that you're making often in revision. So I don't think you have to have the right idea in your head from the get-go. Objects can reinforce characterization. Um, this is really handy uh, to avoid kind of repeating a name or to have a person in a room even if they aren't present. So if you associate, um, a character with an object, like let's say an ashtray. Um, they're holding the ashtray, they're tapping into it in a scene. And then in the next scene, the ashtray is still there. That ashtray comes to represent that person. So it's really, it can be really efficient. Um, in order to not have completely stagnant dialogue where your two uh, characters are, are standing straight with their arms down at their sides, not moving around. An object can be tossed around, moved, handed, thrown, all kinds of options there. Um, and it's really helpful um, to create a forward motion in your scenes. It feels awkward. I just taught a class on objects um, a few weeks ago, slightly different focus, but my students felt like it felt awkward they struggled with having their characters hold the object and move around with it because it felt unnatural. But it is what we do. We fiddle and we turn and we wash dishes and we do all of these things. It might feel strange writing it in, but I think once it's incorporated into the scene, then you can see how it's, it's really working. Um, an object can help reinforce point of view. So for instance, one person can see an object, but someone else can't. So we can sort of see how people are in a room or um, one person can see an object because they have superpowers, right? And there's all kinds of things you can do to sort of, sort of set, set that up. It can uh, create tension. And here, this comes to that kind of three object thing I was talking about before. You have a table, a chair, and an orange, right? It's already a tiny, tiny scene that you've set up. There's tension in there. We don't understand exactly how they go together. And so there's a scene forming. Um, if you're stuck with writing, um, you know, I think putting three objects together and just trying to incorpor incorporate them into a scene can often create a character, can often create um, a concept or tone that you want to examine within a story. And finally, objects can work as a clock. Um, I'm going to stick with my wine bottle uh, example <laughs> because I because it's it's lodged in my head but you know if the beginning of the story the wine bottle is full and if we get to like paragraph three and the wine bottle is empty your character has just drank a lot of wine right time has passed um we know that things are changing um so there's one way that's kind of a linear time it can be a clock without saying oh they started at nine and they ended at nine thirty. you know you can have the bottle slowly drain um another thing you can do is it can help you move through layers of time so you can have perhaps a photograph of a wine bottle, no, no, a photograph. And um, the photograph can be in the present scene, but the content of the photograph can be a memory and they can be happening simultaneously. So the object can kind of help you time travel in a way. Um, and if anybody is interested in that specific idea, I, I, I have a story I could email to you that really shows how um, this uh, writer, Jim Tomlinson does it with a photograph and a piece that I didn't have time to fit in here. But um, it's really handy if you're, if you're interested in time and memory and how do we replicate that on the page, um, objects can really um, work to your favor. Um, so any 
questions about this list? I can't see the questions now. I can see the chat, so if I have questions, just throw them up there. Um, people would definitely like to read that story. Oh, great, good. So I'll just, maybe I'll just send it to you, Sheila. Sure, yeah. And then you can just send it out to, or Joe or whoever. I can yep. send it. Yeah. It looks like we had, um, we had, we missed a question from Jess Miles before the slide. Is it okay to read that now? Sure, yeah. Uh, Jess asks, how do you determine how many times referring to the bottle or the object is too many times, in addition to develop a sense of does it develop a sense of it through revision and continuing to write? Do you err on the side of being conservative? It's a good question. Um, I think with my story in particular with the bottle, I had to get deep into Francine's state of mind. Um, she's mulling it over. And so for me, it was actually reading it aloud a bunch of times to realize I needed to come back to that bottle because the bottle is like a, an origin point in the story, right? Like it's like the why of the story. This whole story is happening because she smashed the bottle. If not, they just have dinner and there'd be no story to, to write. So for me, I wanted to um, replicate it, but you'll see, um, I'm gonna read a, a excerpt from, um, from uh, The Water Dancer, um, Tanishi Coates' new novel. And you'll see in there um, that, that the object I'm gonna look at in there is only mentioned twice in a 400 page novel, right? So it's figuring out how you want, um, when you want it to work for you, when, when is it important? I know it's a little bit of vague of an answer, but um, I think, I guess I would err on overdoing it because I don't mind cutting. You know, so I would probably overdo it and then be like, oh, wow, there's too much bottle in here. Let's bring it back. That's probably what my, my personal strategy would be. Sherry, the only other question. Oh, wait, nope. We have a question here. I worry about having too much symbolism that may be unintentional. What sort of object should I stay away from? This is a question from Morgan. Uh, that's a good question. You know, I really recommend not thinking about symbolism <laughs> at all, ever, um, when you're writing. I mean, I guess that's that's the check off in me, right? Like, do not, do not try to make the objects into symbols. Like, don't try. Like, they they can often become symbols, but like, I just feel like uh, it's almost always overwritten if you kind of try for that that um, symbolism. Yeah, I mean, I guess there are certain things, right, that um, are a little tricky, like. Um, religious symbols, crosses, roses are probably a little weird because we associate them with love, the red roses associate them with love immediately, um, unless you want to work against that. Yeah, I can't, I mean, I feel like anything I would say, I can, I can create a counter argument for it, but I feel like you can't force the symbolism. That's, I guess that's the main point is like, I think you can use any object, but don't try to make it do too much work for you, the narrator. That kind of goes back to me talking about the object should be associated with the character, right? And the, and the character should be interacting with it. Sorry, the last question actually is a question about, can you send the PowerPoint <laughs> after this presentation is over? <laughs> um, sure, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, that's no problem whatsoever. Great. Okay. Um, okay, so now, uh, Joe, if you could go to the how to set a house on fire slide, thank you. Um, so this is what I'm about to read. I just have it up here so you can read along with me and you can kind of really visually see how many objects are in this story. Um, this story is from the anthology Flash Fiction Forward, um, which is the red one to look at. Um, if you're teaching, uh, it's a great anthology to use in the classroom. I've used it for years and years now, um, from undergrad to graduate students. Uh, so this story, How to Set a House on Fire, I'm going to read it aloud to you, and then we can look at how the objects work. This is a much different strategy with objects. These objects are connected to plot. They're moving the, they're moving the story forward um, really deliberately. So I'll read through and then um, we can kind of talk about the objects a little bit. How to set a house on fire. Before you light the gas, light a cigarette under the old red maple in the front yard, under a, under a hunter's moon and take a last look. Before this, 
walk through the ranch house with a miner's lamp and pesticide sprayer topped off with high test racing fuel. Before it was your father's house, it was his father's too. Before foreclosure on the family farm, before the new highway. Spray the gaps in the oak floorboards and get into the heating ducts. Hit the horsehair plaster and take out electric sockets, then run a heavy gas line out to the barn. There is a combine, that is a backhoe. At one time, chickens lived here. Before leaving, make sure the hay bales drip with fuel. This was feed once. On your way, toss your house keys in the water well. Before doing anything else, make a wish. After filling the bird bath next to the old red maple with the remaining octane, call Herm up at the fire station. After he gets on the line, tell him to come over and bring a truck or two with a crew. There's not much to see now, really. After he asks why, tell him. Tell him how the fire line went from where you stand to the well and then zigzag to the barn. And after the farm equipment blew to the sky, tell him how the furnace did the same. A chain of events, explain, it was a chain of events. After the windows kicked out, there wasn't much anyone could have done. And after Herm asks if you would do it all over again, tell him you would. But come anyway, Herm, tell him that. So here we have um, a story jam packed with objects, right? I mean, it's just kind of leading us forward. Um, I like to look at the objects in the story that you can hold in your hand. Um, you know, you have a cigarette, you have the miner's lamp, you have the electrical sockets, the chickens, the bird bath, the house keys, all of these things um, help characterize the place and the community, right? So this is an interesting piece of flash fiction in that there isn't really characterization um, in a traditional sense happening here. We're characterizing a community and a time and the kind of fall of a family. Um, so here's how, to a degree, uh, I think, you know, some of these um, objects work really well. Uh, in the opening, we have the narrator smoking a cigarette by the maple. And so we already know we, we know the source of the fire, which I kind of love. We have the cigarette, so we never see the fire lit. Um, I just assume it's a cigarette. And um, he's taking his time. This is an arson arson, right? He's taking his time. He's just gonna burn the family farmhouse down and we're gonna watch it, you know, with like all of the kind of pain and sorrow that comes up. We have the great miner's lamp, which would be a weird object, in certain circumstances, but kind of fits in here because we're on a farm, right? And the pesticide sprayer and all these objects aren't weird here because this was once a working farm. There are hay bales and chickens. And I love the chickens because um, they aren't present in this story, but what they do is they show us, this was once a working farm, right? We, they, they show us in a sense, the chickens are a tiny, tiny flashback in a sense, um, just by using the one object. The house keys show us, you know, that um, the narrator is intimate with this house. And I love the object of the birdbath, right? The little domestic touch that there was someone who cared about this place and would watch the birds. Um, so some stories like this could have a great dis emotional distance to them. But I found this story, even from the first time I read it, it's very emotional. You know, there's this sense of like, you're complicit. Um, in this world and for some reason you've been drawn into it and now you must live through it um and there's the intimacy of him calling herm right like it's a first name basis and um and he tells him to come so um this is an example of how of another way to use objects i mean here we're not we're not focusing on one thing it's all of these objects come together to create um mood place, time, concept, all of those things. Um, and we, it ends with this like anguish necessity of burning it down. There's nothing else that can happen. You know, that's like the, it's this foregone conclusion that it's all gonna come down. Um, so I think this is a great example of a unique way of using objects. Um, it's a great story to model. I've used this as an exercise, um, asking students to take objects and make those objects um, 
push the story forward and serve as plot. Um, using second person is also kind of kind of interesting. Um, any questions about the story or any um, anything you'd like to comment on? No? Yes, maybe. Oh, cool. Um, okay. Well, I actually wanted to say, make a comment, if that's okay. okay. Yes, it's great. Um, I love the moment where it's uh, the sentence, a chain of events, explain it was a chain of events. I love the, mm -hmm. the way that works on, on both the level of the, the objects, the, you know, the, the plot that's happening right in front of us, and also obviously the chain of events that have led up to this moment where the narrator is burning down the family farm. Right, yeah, there's a kind of yeah. honesty to that, right? Like, it's a sense, like, um, the author, in a sense, is not hiding that this is a chain of events. It's like kind of like putting it right in there, which is actually really interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Maria says she wants to revise everything now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, that's the goal. The goal is for you to leave here wanting to revise everything. And Holly says, I stole her, I stole what she was going to say, basically. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a really great piece. I mean, this is under 500 words. I just think it's so rich. It's such a great example of how you can create a really full story with so little, so little words. Um, but I don't want to, um, oh wait, there's one. You see it? I enjoy how the reader moves like the fire might from object to object. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's almost like the the narrator wants to control how the fire will go, right? There is a mm -hmm. there is a great control to how this happens. Like it's like there's a lot of like kind of planning to it. Yeah. 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 Garth, we'll make sure you have the slides. Awesome. Um, Okay, so now I don't want to focus the whole, um, my whole talk on um, short work because I feel like not, um, objects become very important when you're putting together uh, a book length manuscript, a novel or a novella, or even a really long short story. Um, and so uh, I want to use the, an example from um, Tanishi Coates new book, um, The Water Dancer, which is big, it's thick, it's 400 pages. Um, and it's his, it's his first piece of fiction. So in that sense, I like to look at debut books. I mean, of course, he has written a lot of other things and he has a lot of writing skills, but it is interesting, I think, to look at people's first books. Um, and so I'm going to read uh, two different scenes in the book to you. Um, Joe, if you could go to the, um, the first, yeah, thank you, the, the first slide. Um, so this uh, paragraph comes on page four. Um, it's a 400 page book, so page four is like right smack in the very opening. Um, I'm going to read it aloud and, um, and then talk a little bit about uh, what Coates does um, with, with the jar in, in, this, in this piece. Okay. And she was patting Juba on the bridge, an earthen jar on her head, a great mist rising from the river below, nipping at her bare heels, which pounded the cobblestones, causing her necklace of shells to shake. The earthen jar did not move. It seemed almost a part of her, so that no matter her high knees, no matter her dips and bends, her splaying arms, the jar stayed fixed on her head like a crown. And seeing this incredible feat, I knew that the woman patting Juba, wreathed in ghostly blue, was my mother. Okay, the opening of this book, in my opinion, it's one of those books that you're thrown into a world and you, you need to figure it out, right? There isn't a lot of like setting us up. So it's very confusing in the beginning. Um, when you read this, I'm sorry if you haven't read the book yet, I'm about to spoil it. Uh, just one 
thing, or maybe more than that, but it's a great book. You should read it anyway. It doesn't really matter what I'm about to say. Okay, so the, our narrator can see the woman dancing, and it's his mother. She's dead in the real world, right? So he's seeing a dead person dancing with the jar on her head, right? When we read this on page four, we don't know she's dead yet, but we find out very soon that Hiram, our narrator, is the only person who can see this, right? So this, this, this kind of goes into that point of view point I was talking about with objects. This object, this person dancing with, with the jar on her head, um, we learn a specific point of view because of that, right? Because he, he, he can see it, other people around him cannot. Um, so it's a great way of helping to establish point of view, helping to establish our main narrator as well. Um, and so there's a kind of magical quality to the book, right? There's a kind of like the idea, there's a, a merging of memory, there's um, a present scene in which this kind of non-present scene is actually playing out. Um, and so he sets all of this up. Then we don't, we don't see the jar. We don't, we don't know anything about any of this until we get to page 92. So Joe, if you could go to that next slide. So we get to page 92. So this is a hundred pages in, it's a quarter of the way into the book. Um, when the same image comes back. So I want to, it's kind of long, but I want to read this to you because it's a great example of how to, how to, cycle an object back in and for it to have specific meaning. So here we go. Amici had pulled a chair out from out of the quarters and a wash pan and sticks. And with this, he was tapping out a beat, something up and happy. And then two, then three tasking folk began clapping and slap, slapping their knees. And then I saw Pete, the gardener, walk over with a banjo and then strum the strings. And then it felt like it all happened at once, spoons, sticks, jaw harps, the dance was upon us, had bloomed seemingly of its own accord, and there was now a circle of her skirt, swaying her hips to the beat, and now, and, and what I now saw was an earthen jar on the girl's head, and looking down to her face, I saw that the girl was Sophia. And then there's another paragraph, and then this paragraph. I watched Sophia, a flurry of limbs, but all under control, and the jar seemingly fused to her head, never moving. And when one of the men got too close, I watched her pull him in and whisper something, which must have been rude, for the man stopped there and simply walked away. And then she looked and saw me watching her, and at that she smiled and walked toward me. And as she did, she angled her head so that the jar slid, and reaching up with her right hand, she caught the jar by the neck. Now standing in front of me, she sipped from the jar and then passed it to me. I drew it to my lips and recoiled at its taste, for I had assumed it to be water. She laughed and said, too much for you, huh? Right? So here, this is the only other time that we see the, this kind of dance and we see a woman with a jar in her head, but it's not his mother now. It's a character named Sophia. And we know subconsciously that Sophia is important to the story because of the earlier scene of the mother with the jar on her head. It's unavoidable. We know that even if it looks like Sophia is going to die, even if Sophia goes out of the narrative for a while, we know that Sophia is coming back, right? And so in a really long book like this, you need to have these, um, these these objects kind of tapped in as like stakes to lead the way. Um, when I read this scene, I was like, oh, the jar, right? It's a, it's a kind of grounding. It's like, oh, this is important. And this, 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 this character is important. But it wasn't that Coates just brought the jar in, had her dance and leave, because that is like, gets into that weird symbolism thing, right? Women, jars, water, blah, blah, blah. Um, Instead, there's this great scene of her tipping the jar down and she has booze in the jar. You know, it becomes that idea of an object being passed back and forth, right? With dialogue, because after this, the dialogue continues. Um, so Coates is doing all of these things with the object, you know, really kind of um, 
uh, in a rich way so that this, this, you know, it's just a jar in, on, on a woman's head, but suddenly it ends up um, helping us understand the book and um, helps guide us forward. I will say also that um, in the first slide, the, the dead mother has on a shell necklace, um, which is like that, it's what? It's two words, shell necklace. Um, that necklace, ends up becoming important on about page 350, right? So that's another way that he, he took this object and he stretched it out and it has great meaning um, very late in the book and starts pulling all of this together. So this is a way you can incorporate objects um, into longer pieces. This doesn't have the intense quality of the other short story pieces that I read, but they serve like really practical purposes um, within the work. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to say there. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? This is a, like a kind of entirely different, much more um, comp kind of complex strategy. <laughs> Love that novel, but it was a slow burn. It's a long book. It's long. Yes. Like, it's a good quarantine novel, I thought. <laughs> Any questions? Um, how much do I trust my reader to remember my objects? And then, um, so would it be mapped out before writing or organic? These are both great questions. Um, I think you should trust your reader to remember your objects. Um, I don't think you have to be heavy handed with it. I don't think I, I super consciously remembered the shell necklace from the opening scene. But when we, when we turned back to it, it was like, you know, when you kind of were like, you see someone in the grocery store and you think, oh, did I go to high school with them? It was kind of like that kind of like, oh, I kind of remember that shell neck. Right. Yes. Okay. Of course. Yes. That was his mother. You know, um, your readers like to work that out a little bit. I mean, you don't want to be completely confusing. Of course you have to be, you know, it has to be, you know, consistent in the logic of the world, but I think you can trust your, your reader quite a bit to connect things for you. Um, would it be planned in advance? I'm guessing, I was thinking about this today, actually. I'm guessing that Coates started with that image, right? I, that he started with that dead mother dancing with the pot on her head image. Like, I can't imagine that that was added in, but I'm usually, I'm not usually, I'm often wrong. I'm often wrong about that kind of stuff. Like, the author will say, oh, I wrote that scene last, you know. Um, but it's such an evocative image and it fits into the culture, um, the, the kind of intimate slave culture that he's writing about, like the, 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 the time when they're away from white culture. Um, the juba dance is a traditional dance that was done. So there's a lot going into it. Um, I think that probably that object was probably planned, but I know in my own novel, uh, I wrote a full draft and then I went back in and I, I realized kind of like um, important objects that I wanted to string through. I, I added those in, in revision. So I think it's probably usually a mix. Um, and sometimes you might realize, oh, I, I, it's too complicated. I put in too many of these kinds of touchstones and some of them have to, have to come back out. Yeah. Um, Mamet talks about objects changing or transforming over time. Do you have any feelings about objects being static or dynamic over the course of a piece? Well, again, I do think like it's a great way to show time. So that makes sense to me, especially with Mamet. Like the idea of an object transforming definitely shows a passing of time and I think would be incredibly helpful with a longer piece, you know, um, being able to show. Um, actually, in um, you can't see the other side of this computer. There are stacks of books everywhere because I work at my kitchen table, even though I'm trying not to. Um, this book, Run, to, Run Me to Earth by, by Paul Yoon, um, 
does just that. I mean, he, there's a, um, this is a great novel, short novel, not like this is a quick read. This is the novel you read after you finish the Coates novel. Um, there's a piano in this book that, that comes into the book over a great period of time. So in the beginning of the book, it's played. By the end of the book, it's falling apart and people are kind of storing things in it. So like, it was a great way of showing uh, decades passing um, in, in that book. So that's, you know, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great strategy. Um, I've read that seven or more times of description are helpful for visualization, like give seven details to help visualize a scene not repeating the thing seven times. So seven objects or seven elements of description um, should be used to visualize a scene. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Maria, for the clarification. Um, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I've never thought of that, but that like I do like to, I like having some guidelines. Think about, okay, if you're going to create a scene, I think you need at least three things because you need to have some kind of tension. So I think, you know, the idea of having seven elements to a scene is a great idea to, to think, well, once I put seven elements in, step back and see, does that create a full and rich scene? I think it's good to be able to try, you know, those, those, kinds, of, those kinds of things. Um, oh, wow, we're totally running out of time. People. Okay, um, so I'm going to give you, because we're running out of time, I'm going to give you two, does that make sense? I'm going to give them two exercises to, to take with them. Um, we do have, a, we have a half an hour. So the first oh, eight. Yeah, oh, oh, excellent. Okay, I thought we were <laughs> eight. Whew, ah, whew. I was about to panic. Um, Don't panic. Okay, we're not running out of time. Excellent, so I can do my exercises. Um, okay, um, Joe, you can take down the, the PowerPoint if you, if you want to. You can see all the humans again. Um, I'm not talking to a, a white screen, which is kind of weird. Mary, um, before yeah. you continue, I just wanted to ask you would, you, would you prefer that I unmute everybody so they can just pop in and out? I don't want you to feel like you're just speaking into a void. Up to you. <laughs> If people want to talk, I mean, it's uh, that's fine with me. If people want to just ask some ask some questions, um, now is a good time to ask any questions. Actually, um, okay. before we go into the exercise, um, and I don't. If you want to ask questions about that, you know, jump off of objects. That's okay. That's okay too. Um, okay. Any questions? Now I'm trying to now I'm trying to figure out how to unmute everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Uh, when it ended, I was like halfway through the stage. Okay. Unmuted all the participants. I think Joe is doing it. Maybe. Yeah, I, I figured out how to unmute everybody. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you can unmute yourself and talk, right? Is that how yeah. it's working now? Yeah, you, I think so. Anybody want to unmute themselves? <laughs> Welcome to 2020. Yeah, we unmute, our, we, we unmute ourselves. <laughs> Any questions? After all that, you don't want to talk. Okay. That's okay. I want to see what other um, objects you put in here. A bullhorn, a record player, eggplant. I like the eggplant, chip flower pot. I like the idea of like starting the day thinking about what object you are. That would be kind of a great like month long project. You have a nice list to work from. Um, okay, so here's an exercise I'd like for you to try with me. Um, I want you to write a sentence and we're gonna stick with the bottle because why not? Um, I'd like you to write a sentence that has a bottle in it um a good sentence um use the words a bottle or the bottle in the sentence um and take you know take a a minute or two to write it and then i'm going to ask for some people to read their sentences aloud um and then there's going to be a second step to the to the exercise 
so um, take a few minutes. Can you repeat the prompt one more time, Sherry? Yeah, just write a good sentence with the bottle in it, the bottle or a bottle, um, as, your, as your kind of object in the sentence. There'll be lots of baby stories born with the bottles in them. Oh, people still can't unmute. I'm working on it. Okay. Okay, um, if you can unmute, then why don't, if, if you would be interested in typing your, um, your sentence into the chat, then I can read a, 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 few, a few of them aloud so we can start hearing kind of. Oh wait. I, I'm not muted, could I read mine? Yeah, there you go. Joe just said you can all unmute now. <laughs> don't all do it at once. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead, read your sentence. Okay. When I think of a bottle of beer, I think of 12 ounce bottles, not 40 ounce bottles with black eye fallout and busted lips that can't complain. Okay, good. Let's hear another sentence. Oh, here's some that people are typing them. Okay. Um, the dust covered Coke bottle sat on the dining room table, half empty. I like the dust there. That's a clock thing. Yeah. Though she considered herself too old for pink things. Oh wait, it moved while I was reading it. Though she considered herself too old for pink things, Suara took her younger sister's water bottle to camp anyway. The mouth of the bottle was soiled with the red stains of her glittery lipstick. So I did not want to drink from it. Oh, that's a love story. He clinked when he walked, then opened his dark cloak to re reveal the bottle for sale. That's a mystery. Each of these can be their own genre of, of, of story. A bottle rolled down the dead end street past the house where the old man once lived and onto the intersection below as a child rode by on their bicycle, missing it by inches. These are good. Uh, Cynthia brushed the thick dust off the bottle with her thumb, holding it up to the bare light bulb in an attempt to read its faded label. There is a kind of character focus thing. He threw the bottle and it smashed against the wall behind her head. It's not going to end well. Somewhere in the back, I heard the bottle roll as I took a left down 2nd Street, rolling and rolling and trying to tell me that 2nd is a one way, the other way. That's good. They called him hands because his hands wrapped around a bottle at the bar like they were wrapped around someone's neck. Oh my goodness. Um, Terry, Grim mm, Terry grimaced as the bottles clinked in celebration of another baby on the way. There's a future. 
The almost black wine bottle mocked me, reflecting my own upside down grimace. Now I've opened it in front of all of these white women that think I know the first thing about the aging process of this $120 of hell. <laughs> Good. Coated in dust and dried red stain marking the bottom, she placed a single peony inside. The bottle brought back long forgotten night. She never let me spray my wrists from the pale greenish bottle. That scent drove Johnny crazy in a way she liked more than she did admit. Okay, I'm just gonna read these two more and then we're gonna go to the second step. The kitsch of the bottle was the styrofoam moon logo fitted over the amber glass. Her fingers itched to peel the raised textured label in thin strips. On the kitchen shelf is a mostly finished bottle of wine left over from Christmas. I like that, that like kind of just, simple statement of the bottle. Okay, so now what I want you to do is take your sentence and I want you to replace the bottle with a radically different vessel, right? Um, it can still hold liquid, but it's, um, it's something entirely different than what you first drafted. And I want you to rewrite the sentence kind of guided by that change. So take a few minutes to do that. You're gonna replace the bottle with a radically different vessel. So let's say you had a wine bottle, now it's a baby bottle, right? Great, like extreme differences. How does that change your sentence? Revise to kind of accommodate it, and then we'll kind of um, go through and uh, I'll, read some, I'll read some of those. Okay. Um, this is a great example. Um, the dust covered gas bill sat on the dining room table unpaid, right? That's um, just an entirely different vibe than having the dust covered wine bottle <laughs> on the on the table. We're now we're now thinking about dead and all kinds of um, more practical things. Um, somewhere in the back, I heard the animal cracker jar packed with my last desperate coins roll as I took a left down Second Street, rolling and rolling and trying to tell me that Second is a one way, the other way. Cynthia hefted the heavy canister onto the counter and carelessly wiped an inch of dust from the face of it holding up her flashlight so she could read the faded label. The white collar was soiled with the red stain of her glittery lipstick, so I wanted to get away. He clinked when he walked, then tore open his army jacket to reveal his camp canteen, right? <laughs> it's all new, it's not quite as um, uh, mysterious as the, as the first one. The almost boulder of an engagement ring mocked me, reflecting my own upside down shock in about 50 different faces. Now I've said yes in front of all, all these expecting people that I think I know the first thing about the, their heterosexuality. I'm not sure how that one goes. I traced the mound of dirt and trash, the old burn pile, and my foot caught on the dial of a dusty 
rusted safe, still locked. So um, as you made the change in your story, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of what happened to you as writer as you were making that change? What are some of the decisions that, that you made um, to accommodate the new, the new object? Yeah. My, um, my first prompt um, focused on a very specific um, possible event, you know, where someone's drinking alcohol and becomes violent. And with the second one, I chose just an, you know, random bottle of ginger ale, but ginger ale, I use ginger ale to, to make my Easter ham, right? So okay, yeah. I, based, I based my ham with the ginger ale and it just had me, you know, flip gears. Yeah. I had to switch gears and get into the descriptions as I could with that. Yeah. So it took you in a totally different tone and direction. Yeah. That's great. That's a good example makes your mindset shift. Um, anybody else? Sure. Um, <laughs> so my first one was about um, uh, wiping the condensation from the bottle on jeans. But when I rewrote it, um, it was a bottle of oil. And then he, um, my character wiped a grease stain down the leg of his jeans and i realized that it was a completely different character a completely different scenario yeah. he wasn't even indoors now <laughs> <laughs> it's great and that's like it's it's more permanent too so the oil is kind of interesting there the condensation is kind of like a, a light detail um yeah that's great so it even moved your scene from indoors to outdoors sort of directing you mm -hmm. yeah that's a great example too somebody else You can wave at me if you want me to try to unmute you if you can't unmute. <laughs> Sorry about this. Someone said... Arista. Arista has it. Okay, yeah, go. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. One of the interesting things that happened was that the object that I thought of immediately was one from memory. Uh, and so uh, the first sentence is kind of about a moment from my life. But when I switched the object, I was able to draw a completely fictional story and setting up that. So yeah, that's great. It is, it is a good way to get out of that autobiography, right? Like, you know, you, you kind of know you want to have this scene and you're taking, a, you know, a moment from life, kind of like what I did with I see this wine bottle at a dinner party. But yeah, being able to switch it out so that you go on a totally different path. It's really um, releasing, I think, as a writer. Yeah. I sort of did the prompt the wrong. Um, I thought you had said to add a second object to it, so that's <laughs> what I did. And and actually, um, in adding um, the baby bottle to the original bottle, and then I also threw in a microwave, um, this character started to emerge. Oh, good, yeah. Which that was could be... cool because I don't ever write fiction, so. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that could be a, another good exercise. You know, you write, a sentence with an object in it and then add another object again you're you know you're already starting to shift things but this is like taking this particular exercise you take your initial object out and are beginning again and it kind of forces you to think a little differently um stacy says as soon as i changed the vessel the verb had to be different and the character had to change a glass bottle would be treated more gingerly than a still canteen so the handling um so the handling changes how it's to be handled and then changes the character's moves. Yeah, I think it feels like, right, it's like, is it fragile, is it not fragile? The actual actions of the character are gonna shift based on the object that you've selected. Um, uh, let's see, mine was still about expectations of other people, but the situation had more severity the second time. It was like I was a writing, it was like I was writing about, I wasn't writing about the same character. I guess that's what um yeah i find this handy for me uh this idea of um i'm i kind of a pretty firm believer in, in in revision kind of throwing in the opposite of what you originally wrote um it can get you out of a rut and it can get you out of autobiography and um it can start making again the creating the flawed world 
that we live in instead of um, the world we try to make sense of, maybe too much sense of sometimes when we're drafting. Um, so this kind of exercise where you put in something that's, that's not what you initially thought about, it makes you think differently and create a new logic for the world that you're writing. And um, I think that's when we're doing our best work, when we're slightly um, nervous and, and not at ease, right? We've been kind of put a little bit off kilter because now we don't know what the tension is necessarily in this world we're writing. Um, and someone's saying it also applies to creative nonfiction, um, just thinking about what objects you choose, right? You, they still have to be real, but like you can focus on a different object in nonfiction rather than the one you initially selected. Um, anything else? Anybody else want to read those aloud or ask another question? Sherry, could I offer um, an example from nonfiction from my work that might yeah. be useful? Um, so, so I have an essay um, that takes place uh, in a coffee shop. Um, well, it's, an, it's a memoir, so it's about me. I'm the character. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's about going through a divorce and trying to figure out, you know, who you are as a young person in the middle of that. And there are, there's one scene early on in the essay where I describe myself as um, trying to look cute and flirty and pretty and trying to push back against how awful I feel at home. And I have pink hairpins that I wear, like little jeweled little pink hairpins that help me feel good. And then later, towards the end of the essay, what happens is that my um, ex-husband uh, tells me he wants to have a, wants a divorce while I'm on shift at this coffee shop. So I'm on the phone and I get this news and of course I am devastated and I'm uh, disoriented. And when I turn, I, I have the perspective of the woman who is waiting at the counter to order a lemon bar. And I imagine what she sees this time. And this time it's, you know, my streaky, you know, the mascara that's running down my eyes and these stupid pink hairpins. So the yeah. hairpins come back, you know, twice, but the second time you encounter them, the entire, they change the entire mood of, of, of what's happening. That's a great example. So yeah. the, the, the object doesn't actually change. It's the, the kind of perspective on them. Right. It's the perspective, yeah. right. That's a great example that can be oh. in, used in nonfiction or fiction, definitely. Yeah. Um, someone's saying, um, I forget to include objects or at least forget to focus on them, them enough. How do you organically include objects without focusing from the start on writing um, a piece about objects? Um, this is where your handy observation exercise um, comes in. Um, I feel like if you practice observing and writing down a scene and the objects in the scene, if you just make that a, a practice in your life, objects will organically come into your drafts. Um, for me, uh, I did this when I very initially started doing observation exercises. I did them every day for a fall semester, every morning at like 7 a.m. I like to have these things I do. So I did that for a full fall semester. Every morning at 7 a.m., I did an observation exercise for like 20 minutes. Um, and what it did is it radically changed um, how I understood setting in, in my work. And I feel like I really uh, improved the, the craft of setting in my work by learning how to observe, recording uh, the world around me, as a practice. And then sometimes those recordings turned into a setting for a story. So they're based on real observations, but then a character just walks in um, out of nowhere. So I feel like really fluidly incorporating objects, I do think you need to do some practice for it. Um, and also being aware uh, as you're reading, your favorite authors, maybe notating, or if you don't like to write in your books, making a list in your journal of objects that authors tend to use. Um, some people you can kind of chart, you know, Raymond Carver, uh, easy example, you know, coffee cups and cigarettes and canned beer, you know, you can kind of like go through the work. It creates an entire class 
of person that that he's you know kind of world that he's observing um he's really into armchairs too raymond carver um and so you can start like looking at work thinking about objects and i think that also helps you kind of like prime the pump in a sense for your own work um because you know your reader is is going to react to the world you've created um so if you have something a chair that's out of place or if you have something that's that seems off you have to either work that in or it needs to you know you need to kind of go or replace it with something else yeah it's it's interesting i think we aren't usually taught about objects in fiction i mean like in my classes in academia we never like really looked at this micro level but i feel like it's it's much bigger than it seems because this is the the kind of keystone of, of the piece you know if you're not um making specific decisions about objects then um it's a little bit lazy right it's a little bit like um you didn't think through all of the angles i'm not saying you need to have the objects in your draft it's often coming in in revision you're thinking this through on a, on a more kind of finesse level um practice dang i was hoping there was just a cheat code <laughs> i know i know we all want to um for a summer i noticed objects and tried to see if i could pair with another object that started with the same letter that's a that's a good exercise plants and pizza rhubarb and rainbows i like that exercise thinking of um finding an object and then pairing it with an object that starts with the same letter um yeah i mean i think doing exercises some people don't like doing exercises but i find they um they're just good practice, like you would practice a dance routine or what, you know, any kind of like art form, you know, you would sketch and drawing and before painting. I think it's good to just kind of try these things out, see how they work, start noticing your own obsessions on objects. Um, for me, it went from, uh, in my early work, you can tell my, like the kind of, um, you can date my work sort of. In my early work, I had tons of cats. There were, I was really into cats in my work. And they were this object that you know moved around and now um there are lots of dogs you know and of course like i used to own a cat and now i own a dog so i'm like looking at their behavior but it's kind of funny to like look through it and be like oh right yeah i've totally switched to being a dog person now i'm really not interested in having cats in my work um so thinking and realizing that you're changing too as you as you move forward and you get older and you understand more things and so just being aware of that i think is good too <laughs> Um, any other questions? We have just a few more minutes. I think there's one more in the chat from Holly uh, above Valentine's. You see it, Sherry? Oh, what I love to do and try to do consistently is just put all kinds of place and detail in. And then if I need to cut and streamline, it's okay. Is that a good strategy? Um, I think it's a good strategy. I mean, I like to write messy drafts and then spend the bulk of my time in revision and i also like to cut so i think it's figuring out like what your process is um i would so much rather cut than add you know um but that's kind of the flash fiction writer in me in, in some ways but i do think if you put a lot in you have more options you know you can say I'm going to keep this and take this out and, you know, put it to the side and maybe you end up even putting it, putting it back in. Um, any strategy that works that gets, that gets words on the page is a good drafting strategy. Um, let's see. Objects that become touchstones must feel earned through a lengthy, lengthy piece like a novel. When is the best place to introduce them, beginning or middle? That's a good question. Um, I think if you have an important object in a novel manuscript, it has to be introduced in the first 50 pages. You, it, it, those pages, the first 50 pages of the manuscript tend to introduce everything important that will be resolved or examined in the, in the rest of the book. Um, so it depends how long the book is, but it doesn't have to come in the opening paragraph, but I think you do have to get in there, in there early so that it can become a touchstone later. Um, yeah, that's a good question. 
Um, I'm sure I can find things sporadically on the internet about it, but do you have any recommendations for craft books so we can practice observation exercises? <sighs> you know, I, there are, I don't, there aren't a lot of craft books that I love. Um, I do like this book, another book behind my computer. Let me grab it. Um, it's, an exact, it's, a, it's a craft book and it isn't exactly about objects, but I love this book. It's called Meander Spiral Explode by Jane Allison. It was put out by Catapult Books. And what it looks at is design and pattern and narrative. And so in some ways it, it doesn't like, it looks at objects sideways. It looks at how you can structure narratives, not linear narratives, all the other kinds of narratives. Um, I found this book refreshing and it made me think about writing in an entirely different way. Um, I would actually love to teach a whole class that just examines this book and how all of these strategies can be applied to the structure of the structure of narrative. Um, so that's good. And then um, there's a older, not, I mean, not super old, but I think it came out in uh, 2000, and 2000 maybe. Um, the flash fiction guide, the Rose Metal Press flash fiction, the Rose Metal Press guide to writing flash fiction that Tara Massey edited um, has a lot of great exercises in it and a lot, a lot of exercises that are like what I'm talking about, more looking at micro, looking at titles, looking at objects, looking at those kinds of smaller strategies for work. I've, I've used that craft book in class a lot. Um, again, undergrad and graduate, and it's always been really helpful. I don't ever use the whole book, but it, there are enough of the chapters that I find super helpful that that's a book I do, I can recommend. But what I can do too, uh, once we get off this call, I can go up and look at my shelf that has a bunch of craft books and I can include that when I'm including all this stuff that I'm going to be sending to uh, Joe and Sheila to send to send to you. I can, because um, there's one I can't remember the name of right now. Ugh, I can't remember the name of it. It has, has, the, has the word world in the title, but um, it has some good exercises in it that are, that are focused more on smaller craft objects. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll send the title of the craft book. Um, do I research symbolism? Um, I do not research symbolism. I do tarot card. I know there's another class that um, Brittany's doing on tarot cards. I do tarot, tarot card readings, which, which are like a kind of, you know, they can, you can incorporate symbolism, but I don't, do, I don't research symbolism at all. I, that seems a little tricky to me. I don't really want to know um, if I'm tapping into something I want it, I would just want it to happen. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, and Stacy reminded me, um, The Artful Edit by Susan Bell is a, is a craft book that I use a lot in class. It looks at micro and macro editing. Mm -hmm. So I'll send that title too. That's great. Um, really practical guide. Okay. okay. I think we've um, done it, people. We've done it. <laughs> Look at you um, being productive during yeah. a pandemic. Good job. Great. They show <laughs> up and they listen. Um, thanks, everybody. It's Terry, thank you so much. Let's do this. She oh, thank you. you. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. I will make sure that all of the resources that Sherry talked about, plus the PowerPoint presentation, um, my essay in case anybody wants it with the pink hairpins, we'll send all that out to all of you um, probably tomorrow sometime. Joe will it'll be coming from Joe. Um, and please watch your email because we do have a couple more of these uh, set up and we are still planning to reschedule the tarot workshop with Brittany. We don't have a date for that yet, but as soon as we have it, we'll send it out and hopefully you'll get in there. Um, so anyway, everybody have a great evening. Thanks again for your participation. We really Go out and observe the world. Go out and observe. Bye. Bye-bye. Sherry, why don't you stick around, Joe, just so we can be brief. <laughs>